Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good, brother. Good. Good. You know, uh, you think about greeting people and greeting people at the beginning of church here. Lots of pastors, they would say, good morning, church. That would be good. Uh, Good morning, brothers and sisters, part of the family. Yeah, that's all good. But today I just say, good morning, friends. Amen. Uh, Good morning, friends. Uh, We're going to open up with a scripture, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Excuse me. Uh, uh, This week I uh, emailed my (coughs) cardiologist and I was concerned because, you know, I needed to, uh, I want to be able to get out there and do some exercise. And he said, he responded, yes, it's okay for you to do some light walking. Now, What's in his definition of light walking? What's my definition of light walking? What's my wife's definition of light walking? Mm-hmm. Um, here it is right here. Here's my definition. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all of sin. There's my definition. Walking, uh, when he said you can do some light walking, I said, well, it's a beautiful week this week. I'm going to get out there and walk in the light and enjoy the fellowship that I can have with Jesus, okay? Jesus does say in, uh, I think it's John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So our encouragement today, every day, is to walk in his light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that you are the light of the world And Lord, there's just so many people that don't see that light, and they are walking in darkness. They don't even know it, Lord. But we have this great privilege, those of us who call you Lord and Savior, to be able to not just walk in the light on Sunday mornings, Lord, but every single day of the week to be able to fellowship with you, to abide with you, and to walk in the light. So, Lord, as we come into your house today, I pray that we would be encouraged by that and that it would lift our souls that we may be able to worship you and praise you as you ought to be worshiped and praised. We thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you are willing and able, you can stand with me as we worship this morning. Raised to 
And all the world will praise your great name. Your great name. You were on your throne. You were God alone. 
unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable. Unshakable, unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, that's what you are. You were God alone from before time began. You were on your throne, you were not alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are not I will 
trust in you, Lord, because you are trustworthy, Lord, because of your great name, Lord God, and the things that you've done for us, Lord, what we don't deserve, but because of your grace, Lord God, and, and we thank you, Lord. I just thank you for everyone here, everyone who can hear this uh, uh, service and this, uh, this is what's happening right now, Lord God. I just pray our hearts would open to you, Lord, that we would just rest in this moment and just receive what you would have for us. Holy Spirit, just open our hearts, Lord. I pray for Pastor, that you would give him the unction to deliver the word as you would want it. Help him, Lord, and help us to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's all greet one another. Well, I guess uh, nobody had a, had trouble with their clocks this morning because nobody showed up for worship to practice this morning. I mean, the worship team did, which is good, and they were all on time. You know what I mean. I really appreciate the worship today, uh, especially the, the second to last song that we sang, You Are God Alone. And there was one particular verse that says, right now, in the good times and the bad, you are on your throne, and you are God alone. It reminded me of Job chapter 2, where he had lost his health and everything, and he said to his wife, well, we won't say what his wife said to him, but, but you got to understand, she lost everything. And she's watching her husband suffer. And uh, he said to her, shall we receive good from the Lord and not adversity? And sometimes that's what it is. We have adversity. And as Mike said to me this morning as I walked in, you don't have enough drama in your life. You know, if you needed some more, hey, you know, and that, that last song that encouraged us to trust in the Lord at all times. He's on the throne, and he's overseeing everything. And that makes all the difference in the world as we go through good times and bad times, you know. Uh, if a, a little update on Dee. Uh, you can see she's not here today. She's having a good day today. And she had a rough week with her stomach, you know. She got one more uh, day of radiation treatments. That's tomorrow. And hopefully, we're hoping that we'll see her here next Sunday. Okay? So, but we really do appreciate all of your prayers. And would you please continue to lift her up? She does say to me, I feel the prayers. So please continue to pray for her. Now, uh, I just want to remind you that on Thursday nights here, we're having a Foundations of the Faith class. We're, what, on, on number five this week? I think we have 11 of them, and there's, there's number five this week. Uh, which one was it? Do you remember? Salvation? Yeah. Yeah, it's foundational to your faith, okay? So let me encourage you to come. Uh, 7 o'clock on Thursday nights. Now, also, we, we worship in giving, and I need to remind you that that's part of our, what's going on. There's going to be a scripture on the wall, Proverbs eleven twenty four through 25. This is not the New King James. This is the King James. Did, did you notice that, Becky, when you put this up there?
Yeah, I wanted King James, but that's okay. I'll read it to you. There is that, that I, I just like the way this goes, okay? There is that scattereth and yet increases, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it, it tendeth to poverty. You like the King James, do you? I like this part. This is what I did. The liberal soul shall be made fat. What does this one say? Rich. I, I didn't really, you know, we're not after being rich, okay? But fat is okay. All right? You get what I mean. The, <laughs> fatness in the soul, yes. The, the Lord is just saying, I know this goes against human thinking, but my thinking is different. There are those who give generously and are liberal with their giving, and the Lord takes care of us. Let's put it this way, that way, okay? The Lord takes care. Because you know what? He doesn't really care about your money. He doesn't care about your money at all. He doesn't deal in money. But so many times money comes, it's in the heart of man, and he wants your heart, okay? He wants our heart. So he wants us to be able to give and give, you know, with cheerfulness in our heart and know that, hey, he's going to take care of us, okay? So uh, let's just pray. Father, we thank you today for your goodness to us. Lord, everything that we own, it all comes from you anyhow. It's all yours, uh, Lord. And what you really want from us is what you're concerned with most of all is our hearts, our soul. It's, it's of more worth to you than anything in this whole universe. So we, we thank you for your love for us, Lord. Help us to be more like you, more like you, Lord. I just remember that verse, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave. Lord, you give because you love. And so we thank you that you're our example, Lord. You give us everything. And for those that may be here today that are going through a tough time, Lord, in different ways, I pray that they would know your presence your hand, and your provision, everything, Lord. We just trust you implicitly. And we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25. And I'm going to attempt to get through the entire chapter today. It's only 34 verses, but it's, a, it's a, an account. And I'm going to frame this this way. You guys can remind me if I forget, but I'm going to frame this as uh, we're, we're going to eat today. Okay? We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a meal. You know, we're going to have a meal today. And, you know, usually with meals, you have different courses. I remember that uh, I worked with an uh, Italian guy, and uh, we asked him one day. He's quite a, a big guy. And uh, we asked him one day, What's it like at Thanksgiving at your house? Oh, we start eating first thing in the morning. And we, he described how they eat through the whole day. I said, how do you do that? He goes, the secret is you don't stop. <laughs> Once you stop, it's all over. <laughs> well, you know, and there's different courses. Well, we're, we're going to have some different courses today, okay? We're going to have some appetizers, maybe salad, maybe a soup, and then the main course. So you, you'll have to wait to the end for the main course, okay? But Genesis 25, verses 1 through 34, we saw last week that Isaac, uh, he, he was married. He got a wife. Abraham had said he was, he was concerned for his son because he had lost his mother, and so he gave him a wife. God gave him a wife. But it goes on. We're still talking about Abraham here. And it says in verse 1, and you'll remember that uh, Abraham lost his wife, Sarah. And it says here in verse 1, Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bore him Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Latushim, and Lemimit. I don't know how to say this. This is going to be tough. Leumin, min, mim. 
And the sons of Midian were Ephah, Epher, Hanak, uh, Abadah, and Eldah. All these were the children of Keturah. So Abraham remarries, you know, and I got thinking about this. You know, he's, he's pretty old. And yet he's remarrying. Well, just remember what God had said to Adam. He said, be fruitful and multiply. So maybe that's the attitude here. Well, I'm still, so I'm going to fru- be fruitful. I need a wife. You know? So he remarries, and he has six sons, and then it tells of us of his grandsons. Now, I want you to keep in mind today that as we go through this chapter, God is giving us some details. He doesn't give us details of every single human being that was born. He gives us the details as it applies to his plan of salvation. Abraham and his family and what God has promised him already and how it applies, it's going to lead all the way to our Savior, Jesus Christ. So keep that in mind as we're reading Genesis 25. Uh, you know, why is this, well, is this good for me to know these things? Well, it's good for you to know because God had said to Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And that's what is happening here. And it, it goes on and it says, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to the son of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. As I said, he's the father of many nations. He sent these sons. He did provide for them. He did give them gifts, but they are not the sons of the promise. Isaac is the son of the promise. His line will lead to Jesus eventually. So, but he wanted separation there. And this is where we get a lot of the Arab nations eastward. You know, you know I think it's, a, what does it say here? Sheba and Dedan, that is Saudi Arabia, you know? So we see that. And you know, I'll remind you again, you know, they, they all claim Abraham as their father. You know, they go, they go back to Abraham. He's the father of many nations. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's great to live at this time, 2022, because we see the Bible coming to pass, as he said it would. He was going to regather the nation of Israel, and he has done that. And if you really want to pay attention to what's going on in the world, you'll keep your eyes on what's happening in Israel and how, how this, all, all the nations around them affect what's going on in our world today. I, it was so interesting to me when our last president uh, was making treaties, and they called it the Abraham Accord, right, with all these other nations that wanted to have relations with Israel. It's it's kind of cool to see that right before our very eyes. But we see it started here in Genesis. And it goes on this. And, uh, let me just tell you, that's, that's one of the appetizers. Okay? It's, it's not very filling. But it's, it's good for us to, to know these things. It says, this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. I need to stop there. Gathered to his people. So we see that Abraham dies. He's 175 years old. But it is worded this way. I'm not sure what you have in your Bible, but this is the new King James. It says it was gathered to his people. What does that make you think of, that that very phrase? To me, it means, it just said he was dead, but he's not dead, is he? He's gathered to his people, his ancestors, his, his father, his, all those. And, you, you know, this is another time where I get to say, hey, death is not the end. Okay, death is not the end. And many people think that that's it. But the Bible doesn't say that at all. 
It says that it's the beginning of something else. It's moving day. Abraham moved to another place. And if you want to read more about it, Jesus himself talks about it in Luke 16, right? There was a rich man and another man named Lazarus who was poor, a a beggar. And they both died. And Jesus tells us what happens to those two when they died. He was Jesus, the Son of God. He's truth, right? He's telling us the truth. It's not over. There's more to come. And in that particular thing, at at that time, Luke 16 talks about a place called what? Abraham's bosom. Okay, all the Old Testament saints and believers went to Abraham's bosom. But now I believe that that's empty. When you die now, they couldn't go before Jesus to heaven, okay? Jesus had to be the first one resurrected. And when he was resurrected, he took them with him, with him to heaven. And I believe when we pass off this earth, we are gathered to our people. My father and my mother. I believe that I will see my father and my mother again in heaven. They are not there because they were good. Or bad. Okay? They are there simply because of one thing. They both claimed and knew Jesus as their Savior. That's where I'll see them. And I'll, I will see them like I've never seen them before. I'm going to be gathered to my people. I hope that there's others that are there, grandmas. I'm not sure. We'll see. But I know, my, and maybe you're thinking of somebody right now that you know, and you're going to see them again. You know, I had a lady here on Friday night, Friday night light, Ann was her name, and uh, she said, you know, preachers, they don't preach enough about sin anymore. And I appreciate that. I have to say, Lord, are you just, you know, giving me a little side note here? You know, I I can appreciate that because we do need to talk about sin, you know. But I really need to talk about the vaccine for sin. Okay, I'm going to take that time right now as we say it. We're talking about being gathered to our people. Sin is what keeps us from God. We, We fall short. Every single one of us fail. As I said, my mother and my father. They're in heaven not because, you know, they were good people and they didn't sin. No, we're all sinners, and they were too. And, but they they claim Jesus, and he's the vaccine, isn't it? He's the cure. God gave us the cure. I have to say this. I know that you guys probably already know this. Why is he saying this? I'm saying it for the camera. I don't know who's listening. Or I don't know who's even in this room today that doesn't claim Jesus as his or her Savior. And so I have to tell you the truth. Jesus is the Savior. He paid for your sins. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. Do you believe this? And so I have to challenge that today and put it out there you know jesus did not come to destroy men's lives he came to save them and that's that's what this is really all about today so i saw saw a little jumping off point gathered to his people abraham was gathered there's there's something that's offered to us a future eternal life and there's only one way to obtain it it's through jesus christ Claim him as Savior today. But let's go on. In verse 9 it says, And his sons Ishmael and Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, 
There Abraham was buried and Sarah, his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt at Beer Lahiroi. So we see that Abraham passes off the scene. They bury him next to his wife in the cave that he had already purchased. And, uh, and then it's going to move on. See, this is the, what we're talking about. God's plan of salvation, it moves to Isaac. And so God blesses Isaac. The same blessing with which he blessed Abraham, he gives to Isaac. And Isaac's going to give to Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. And on and on it goes. But it gives us details here. In verse 12, it says, Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. Do you remember Ishmael? Born of the flesh, Hagar, the, the servant, and God separated them out. But it seems that there's a, a reunion at the grave site of Abraham between Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael, I do believe, is a believer. Abraham taught his son. You know, and you remember when he was out in the desert with his mom and there was no water, who cried out to God? Ishmael did. And God heard his prayer. But it tells us of the genealogy of Ishmael. And it says in verse 13, And these were the names of the son of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nabajoth, then Kedar, Ab- Adbeel, Mibsam, Boy, these names are great. I wish they were just like Bob, Joe, you know, Sue, Hadar, Tima, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedama. These were the sons of Ishmael, and th- these were their names by their towns and their settlements. It says 12 princes according to the nations. And then it goes on, verse 17, there were, these were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died, and what? Gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. As you go towards Assyria, he died in the presence of all his brethren. His whole family was there. So it tells us of Ishmael what happened to him. But this comes the important part in the next verses. This is the genealogy of Isaac. The record, recorded record. Abraham's son, Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padamaram, the sister of Laban, Laban the Syrian. So we read that last week. Uh, Here's something interesting to me. This is going to be our salad, okay? If you don't mind. It says, now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Oh, what a great verse. Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife. That's what we ought to be doing, men, if you're married. Praying for your wife. Praying for your wife. You know, it just reminded me, there was another lady that was barren. We'll read about her in the future, 1 Samuel. Her her name was uh, Hannah. Hannah, thank you. You know, things go away easy. Hannah. Now, she was married to a guy named Elkanah, and he had two wives, and the first wife was, you know, producing children like crazy. Hannah, she was barren, and she wanted a son so very badly, and she let her husband know. So what was his reaction? Aren't I better to you than ten sons? Come on, look at this. That was his attitude. Is that the right attitude? No. He's not really listening to his wife, right? His wife is crying, I want a baby. You know, that was her desire. And just like a lot of us guys, we don't listen. We're not really listening. 
we might hear, it's kind of like that Charlie Brown. <laughs> no, can't be that way. You know, aren't I better than 10 sons to you, you know? Then there was another guy we're going to read about in a few chapters. His name is Jacob. Well, guess what? His wife, one of his wives, has the same problem. She's barren. And she tells her husband, Jacob, that she wants a baby. That's her desire. What does he say to her? Am I God? Tell me, is that the right reaction? So you can see, guys, I'm, I'm giving you a little counsel here. Praying for your, your wife. No, Jacob didn't do very good. Elkanah didn't do very good. But Isaac does exactly what we should be doing. He, he pleads w- with the Lord for his wife. He prays for his wife. He's listening to her. He can feel her emotions and what she desires in her soul. He realizes he can do nothing. So he goes to the one who can. Didn't we sing that today? God is able. God is able. Do, we sing the song, do we believe it? Yes, God is able. You know, on the wall, Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, to give us a little bit of a clue. I'm so, you know, when I, was, when I was thinking about this a couple of days ago and writing out these notes, there was a... St- a secular song that came to mind. And I just want to belt it out right now, but I just can't belt it out like Percy Sledge did. When a man loves a woman. Yeah, I can't do it. Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Nourish. If you're not sure how you should be treating your wife, nourish and cherish. Nourish and cherish. Just those two things will be quite enough. And let me me remind you that uh, I think it's in 1 Peter, maybe 2 Peter 3, 7, it says, Your prayers can be hindered if you don't treat her right. That was a salad. Let's move on. It says, you know, the Lord heard and and granted his plea, so Rebecca becomes pregnant. Verse 22, it says, but the children struggled within her, and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. That's a good place to go. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. God speaks, and he goes, oh, I'm, I'll tell you what's going on. Okay, there's two. You got, you're having twins. You're having twins, and they're going to struggle. And the older one, you got to remember this, that the older one is going to serve the younger. That's not the way it usually goes, right? In that culture. The older one, the God said, this is the way it's going to be. The older one shall serve the younger. But just to, uh, let's have some soup now to go with our meal. It says the children struggled together within her. What does God call what's in the womb? Children children it's not just a mass of tissue it's not god calls it in his word the way it is inside that womb there's life the heart is beating god is working he is directing the cells and they're becoming what they need to become and what he has designed them to become In each and every individual, he's doing a work. He is involved in the work, and he says there's two. And what are they doing? 
They're struggling. <laughs> yeah, like brothers do. As I grew up with three brothers, you know, we struggled a lot. There was one point in time that three of us were about the same size, so you and we're teenagers and hungry all the time. Yeah, there was there was struggles, you know. So many other times other people would pick on me or whatever. My older brother would say, you know, it's okay for me to beat up on him, but it's not okay for you. <laughs> That's the way it is. They were struggling together. And she wondered what was going on and said, and I like this, she prayed to the Lord. What's going on? And he tells her specifically what's going on. It needs to be told to her because she ends up telling Isaac, and Isaac needs to pay attention to this. God said, the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau, which means hairy and red. His name was Harry. After his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob, which is heel catcher. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So we get an uh, idea of how old, you know, when, when Isaac became a father, he was 60 already. 60 years old. So it says, so the boys grew. You know, there's a lot of other stuff going on in there that God doesn't give us the details. How they went through the terrible twos, the teenage years, you know, voices changing, things like that. The boys grow up, and we get as they're older here. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter. Got any hunters in the room? I see one, two, all right. Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. You know what the field represents in the Bible? The world, the world. He was a man of the world. That's key for us to see here today. He was a man of the field. Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. He was a homebody. And this is trouble here, verse 28. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. Man, is that shallow or what? But, you know, that's what men are a lot of times. Food. Food. I did frame this today as a meal, right? Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Do you see trouble there? Dad loves this one. Mom loves this one. Are you supposed to love anyone more than the other? And if you do, don't tell them. Don't give them the idea. But that's trouble here. But do you see how shallow Isa, or, or Isaac is that he loves him because he ate of his game? He's a good hunter, and I love his stew. That's, that's not very deep at all. You know, I suppose I could change the words to this. Uh, Isaac loved Esau because he could play the game. He was an athlete or whatever. So we hold up people in our culture for these kinds of things. And there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that sometimes we make heroes out of men that do not care about God at all. And that's what this is coming down to. This is the meat. This is the main course today. I named this, this message the things of God. The things of God. See, that's what we're going to see here. One doesn't care about the things of God, and one does. A man of the world is Esau. But Jacob, is he a great guy? 
Is he a wonderful person? We're going to say Jacob. His name means heel catcher, but it also can mean dirty, sneaky, rotten thief. Con artist. Yeah. And that's what we're going to see here in the, in the last verses of, of chapter 25. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with, with that r- same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which means red, you know. I, I'm, you know, I, it just took me back to a memory back in, in Syracuse when I was uh, maybe 10 years old. My older brother and I had a paper route, and we had to go to a paper station to get the papers. And all the other guys, I'm the, I'm, I'm like 10 years old. My other, my older brother's 11, and we have to go to this paper station. And everybody else seemed to be like in their later teens, you know. So we're coming in and hanging out with these guys, and they gave my brother. A nickname. His name was Red because of our last name. But he also had red hair at the time. So they called him Red, Red Skelton. What did they call me? Little Red. (laughs) Well, Esau gets the nickname Red here, okay, because it's a red stew. And he has red hair too. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. Birthright was to go to Esau because traditionally it's the older one, and he was older by a few minutes. Sell me your birthright as of this day, Esau said, look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? I'm so hungry I could die. Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus, the Bible tells us here. Thus Esau despised his birthright. What is the birthright? First of all, this transaction that just hap- 